Hello everyone, Dr. Polaris here. The forest rocket terror birds are among the most notorious members of South America's endemic Cenozoic fauna. These carnivorous birds were certainly striking animals. Standing between 3 to 10 feet tall and possessing elongated hind limbs, clawed feet and huge axe-like beaks. However, even with these attributes, the forest rockets were traditionally assumed to have preyed on relatively small animals that could be dispatched with a minimum of struggle. This is due to the fact that with forest rockets' beak proportions, the jaw could not generate a great deal of bite force with which to kill prey. This is disputable, however, as many big game hunting predators such as Smilodon, Great White Sharks and Allosaurus have weaker bite forces and often laterally weak skulls as adaptations towards, not away from, killing large prey. Relying instead on the presence of a cutting edge, a wide gape made possible by the reduction of jaw musculature, and the driving force of the body or neck. Since forest rockets share many of the same adaptations, such as a large, laterally flattened skull with a sharp beak edge and powerful neck musculature, it is possible that they were specialised predators of relatively large prey. This group developed into one of the major lineages of large carnivores in South America, particularly during the Oligocene and Miocene, when cooling and drying environmental conditions led to a rapid expansion in forest rocket size and diversity. In fact, fossil remains of these birds are very rare in South American pre-Oligocene deposits, which has interesting implications regarding their origins. Despite their success, these birds appear to have declined by the end of the Pliocene, perhaps as a result of the Great American Interchange. Although several genera managed to persist in spite of competition from newly arrived placental carnivores, with the genus Titanis expanding into the southern United States. As far as we know, the youngest forest rachid survived until approximately 1.8 million years ago during the early Pleistocene, with the reasons for their extinction still being debated by paleontologists. Like the giant ground sloth discussed in a previous video, terror birds do have significantly smaller modern relatives with these being the terrestrial seriemas of South America, also carnivorous, albeit preying on insects, lizards and small mammals. Seriemas are still capable of flight and dwell out on the open Cerrado grasslands and savannas of Brazil, Bolivia, Argentina, Paraguay and Uruguay. Both forest rockets and seriemas are members of the clade Cariamiformes, a formerly widespread group of mostly terrestrial birds that were native to Europe, North America and probably Africa during the earlier Cenozoic. Cariamiformed as a whole are basal members of Australavis, a lineage that also contains falcons, parrots and the passerine songbirds. Returning to the forest rachids, our understanding of the early evolution of this family is quite poorly understood. It was previously thought that the oldest known terror bird genus was the late Paleocene or early Eocene genus Paleocilopterus, represented by fragmentary remains recovered from Itaborai, Brazil. However, the forest rachid identity of this animal is controversial, and it may turn out to be a more basal cariomiform instead. Interestingly, for a group often thought of as being entirely endemic to South America, Potential terror birds, which may turn out to be the most ancient members of the family, have been described from other continents. The early Eocene Algerian genus Lavocatavis is known from a single right femur and stood roughly five feet tall. Although, again, its identity as a forest rachid has now been called into question. A slightly younger form, Eleutheronis, inhabited what is now France and Switzerland during the Middle Eocene and was about the same size as Lavocatavis. The presence of these birds in Africa and Europe seems strange at first, but, as we have seen in previous videos, various animal groups were able to cross the narrow Atlantic Ocean between South America and Afro-Eurasia during the late Cretaceous and early Cenozoic. Given the greater age of these Old World taxa, as well as the presence of other cariomiforms in Europe and Africa, this may suggest that terror birds first evolved here, and later migrated to South America, much as cavimorph rodents and primates did during the Eocene. Rather than riding on floating mats of vegetation, early, already flightless forest rachids probably island hopped across the ocean via the now submerged Rio Grande Rise and Walvis Ridge. Like ostriches and emus, these leggy terrestrial birds were probably capable swimmers as well, making such a crossing easier than might be imagined. 
The first definitively South American terror birds make their appearance in the fossil record during the Oligocene. Here, the forest rocket phylogenetic tree splits in two, with the more basal branch leading to the Silopterines, a collection of small to medium-sized forms. The oldest of these was the genus Silopterus itself, first known from middle Oligocene deposits of Argentina about 29 million years ago. This was the smallest known forest rocket, with the largest individual standing only 2.7 feet tall and weighing roughly 15 pounds. In terms of appearance, Silopterus would have strongly resembled a modern Seriema, but was more heavily built and possessed significantly smaller wings. Incapable of flight, this genus would have preyed on lizards, snakes, rodents, and small notoungulates striking them with its sharp, curved and naturally compressed claws, then tearing off strips of flesh with its hooked beak. Recent finds from Uruguay suggested that Silopterus may have been the youngest known terror bird, surviving until approximately 96,000 years ago. However, these age estimates have proved to be quite controversial and may yet turn out to be incorrect. Additional members of the Silopterine lineage include the more robust Pliocene genus Mesembryonis, which has been suggested to have been a fast runner capable of achieving speeds of up to 45 miles per hour, which would have enabled this 5 foot tall predator to easily outrun most smaller notoungulates. Meanwhile, the slender Ilawa avis has the honour of being the most completely represented forest rocket, known from a near complete specimen described in 2015. Also native to the Pliocene of Argentina, the completeness of the holotype allowed researchers insight into the internal anatomy of this animal. The bones of the skull were fused, unlike in other lineages of modern birds, which suggests that the genus utilised its head and beak to aggressively strike prey. In addition, CT scans of the inner ear show a sensitivity to low frequency sounds, which may have helped the bird to track its next target, or perhaps to hear the calls of other individuals of its species. Silopterus and relatives can be differentiated from the more derived forest rockets in several ways, including their overall smaller size, more seriema-like builds, and proportionally lower and narrower beaks. The most basal of the as yet unnamed clade of larger forest rockets was also the most massive member of the family. Kelenken was a terrifying predator that stood up to 10 feet tall and weighed in at at least 400 pounds. Possessing a proportionally massive skull with an elongated hooked beak, this middle Miocene Patagonian hunter was a dominant carnivore in its environment, towering over other predators such as the Sporacidont Patagosmilus and feeding on the llama-like Lithopteran Theosodon. Despite its large size, Kelenken was a rather slender animal and was capable of running at high speeds, being as fast as a thoroughbred racehorse. However, the genus was not very agile and would have been quite poor at changing direction while running at speed. This suggests that both Kelenken and most forest rockets in general preferred drier and more open savanna ecosystems, in contrast to the Sebecosusians and Sporacidont metatherians, which were forest dwelling ambush predators instead. Other forest rockets were more heavily built and stocky birds, such as the late Oligocene early Miocene Paraphysornis, which may have been more of an ambush hunt than its leaner relatives. The genus Forest Rarchus, which gives its name to the family as a whole, was one of the largest of these animals, being only slightly shorter and lighter than Kelenken. Native to earlier Middle Miocene Argentina between 20 and 13 million years ago, Forest Rarchus stood up to 8 feet 10 inches tall and weighed in the region of 300 pounds. With a robust and powerful neck, this apex predator was capable of delivering repeated strikes with its formidable axe-like beak and could have taken down large prey such as toxodontid notoungulates and litopterns. Contrary to its depiction in Walking with Beasts, Forest Rarchus was not a contemporary of Smilodon populator, dying out roughly 10 million years before the Great American Interchange. The smaller and closely related Patagornis dwelt at the same time and place, being an agile pursuit predator about as tall as an average man. This speedy genus may have targeted the extinct rear Opistheodactylus and the swifter notoungulate such as the rabbit-like Prototypotherium. By the time of the Pliocene interchange with North America that reached its apex approximately 2.5 million years ago, 
Most of the large forest rockets had already become extinct, leaving only a few of the smaller Silopterines to persist until the end of the period. Why these more massive forms died out, by and large during the Middle Miocene, is an open question, with competition from placental carnivores not being an option at this early stage. Perhaps it had something to do with the mid-Miocene climatic cooling trend that seems to have also negatively impacted the diversity of meridiungulates. Despite this generalisation, however, a single large genus successfully invaded North America before the interchange, arriving in the southern United States by around 5 million years ago. This was Titanis, an imposing predator that made its home in Pliocene and early Pleistocene Texas and Florida. Living among saber-toothed cats, horses, and proboscideans, this eight-foot-tall terror bird was overall very similar to Forest Rarchus, but was more heavily built. Like most Forest Rarchids, Titanis would have been a fast runner, and probably preyed on similarly cursorial prey, such as the horse Hipparion, camelids, and pronghorns, although would not have been beyond scavenging from the kills of other predators. It would presumably have been a visually-oriented predator, relying upon eyesight for everything from prey identification to gauging distances between itself and its intended target. Analysis of the brain area of the skull and other forest rachids has revealed an underdeveloped sense of smell, and while it is not yet possible to know this for certain with Titanis, it would probably also have had limited olfactory ability. Assuming that Titanis's skull, which is currently unknown, was similar to that of other forest rachids, then the beak would have been the primarily killing weapon. The tip of the beak would have been strongly curved down to a sharp point, as can be seen in other carnivorous birds today. In feeding, this hook tip pulls at the meat while the lower jaw closes, shearing through the flesh so that the bird has a bite-sized chunk to swallow. In the actual killing process, however, the point of the beak could be brought down onto the neck or back of the prey's skull. This penetrating strike could hit an artery, damage the spine, and even pierce the cranium and enter the brain, causing instant death to the prey in question. Smaller prey may have actually been swallowed whole, although observation of living seriamas suggests that small prey may have been thrown against the ground to stun or kill it outright before it was swallowed. It's also possible that Titanis may have regurgitated gastric pellets, especially after feeding on whole animals. This is seen today in owls, which typically swallow rodents whole, but are unable to digest the fur and bones. The fact that Titanis existed for at least three million years has led to a lot of thought as to what could have caused it to die out. Because Titanis was a fast runner, and capable of tackling anything from small to medium and possibly even some larger prey, it seems unlikely that the cause could have been a loss of prey species diversity. A possible alternative could be competition from newly evolving predators, such as the larger big cats, as well as new forms of canids. These new predators may have begun to displace Titanus as the top predator in its ecosystem, with other carnivores such as Arctodus denying Titanus ready access to carrion from these predators' kills as well. Another possibility that may have had a part in the downfall of this genus is a change in climate. A trend of global cooling that occurred in the Pliocene resulted in the climate of the Americas shifting from forested to drier open savannas and steppe, and even when it was successful it may have had to expend even greater energy trying to chase and defend its kills. This situation, combined with new predators that were better adapted to make use of the environment in hunting, may have combined to steadily overwhelm Titanus to the point where it could not continue to survive. With the extinction of this genus in the early Pleistocene, as well as the disappearance of more modestly sized forest rockets in South America by the late Pliocene, the group finally slipped into extinction. Younger reported remains of these animals from the continent are poorly supported in the scientific literature, with Titanis being the youngest member of the group currently recognised. Although the causes of forest rocket extinction are debated, it is likely that a combination of climate change, the reduction in diversity of potential prey in South America, and, by the time of the interchange, competition with carnivorous placental mammals were involved in their decline. This would leave their smaller Seriema cousins as the last modern members of Cariamiforms, and a reminder of a time when theropod dinosaurs were the dominant predators of Miocene South America, alongside the similarly Archosaurian Sebecosuchians. Thanks for watching, everyone. In the next episode, we'll be taking a break from Cenozoic South America to examine the Amphicyonids, the so called bear dogs of the Northern Hemisphere and among the first large carnivoran mammals. See you again soon. Cheerio.